Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to a new edition of the Daily Debate. In tonight's show we're going to be uh, focusing on uh, the Egyptian role in trying to defuse the situation in Gaza between Hamas and the Israeli side as well. We're going to be looking at the proposal Egypt has submitted, also the UN Security Council resolution that uh, has been worked on by different parties to try and settle and secure a sustainable humanitarian assistance uh, entering the Gaza Strip. But before we start doing that, let's check out a couple of the main stories making the news today. We'll start off with President Abdel, uh, the, rather the Foreign Minister, Sam Shukri, who held talks with his Jordanian counterpart, Ayman al-Safari, in Cairo today. The two top diplomats discussed the navigation of security in the Red Sea, given both its importance to the international trade and as it is part of the national security of both countries. The meeting also dealt with the current situation in the Gaza Strip and endeavors seeking a ceasefire and the implementation of a recent UN Security Council resolution. It called on Israel to allow immediate, safe and unhindered deliveries of aid to Gaza at scale. And humanitarian aid uh, continued to flow into the Gaza Strip through the Rafah crossing with the Palestinian Red Crescent saying that its team has received 4,760 trucks from the Egyptian Red Crescent through the crossing border over the past two months. The trucks are loaded with food, water, relief supplies, medical supplies, medicines in addition to fuel trucks that entered the Gaza Strip. The Palestinian Red Crescent added that it received 1,711 trucks for the UN Palestinian Refugee Agency, the UNRWA, and other agencies. These were a couple of the stories making the news today, but now focusing our attention to the Egyptian role in trying to deal with the situation in the Gaza Strip. Now, Egypt has submitted a proposal to free the hostages, have a ceasefire, form a, a Palestinian Authority Hamas government in Gaza as well, and end the war, period. Let's check out this report, and we'll be right back. Egypt has placed on the table a new proposal for a truce in the war with Hamas and the release of more Israeli hostages held in Gaza, with some indicating that Jerusalem is not flat out rejecting the draft and that it could lead to negotiations. The Egyptian ambitious plan is a plan to end hostilities and release all the remaining hostages in three stages. The first stage of the Egyptian plan would be a two-week halt to the fighting, extendable to three or four in exchange for the release of 40 hostages women minors and elderly men, especially sick ones. In return, Israel would release 120 Palestinian security prisoners of the same categories. During this time, hostilities would stop, Israeli tanks would withdraw and humanitarian aid would enter Gaza. The second phase would see an Egypt-sponsored Palestinian national talk aimed at ending the division between Palestinian factions, mainly the Fatah Party-dominated Palestinian Authority and Hamas, and leading to the formation of a technocratic government in the West Bank and Gaza that would oversee the reconstruction of the Strip and pave the way for Palestinian parliamentary and presidential elections. The third stage would include a comprehensive ceasefire, the release of the remaining Israeli hostages, including soldiers, in return for a to-be-determined number of Palestinian security prisoners in Israeli jails affiliated with Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad terror group including those arrested after October 7th and some convicted of serious offenses. In this phase, Israel would withdraw its forces from cities in the Gaza Strip and allow displaced Gazans from the enclaves north to return to their homes. The Hamas delegation headed by the movement's head of political bureau, Ismail Haneya, didn't reject the proposal and vowed to respond following discussions with Hamas leadership in Gaza. Hamas Politburo leader and they returned to Qatar where he's based or after a four-day visit to Cairo to discuss the Egyptian proposal with the group's political bureau. 
In parallel, a delegation of Islamic Jihad held talks in Cairo with Egyptian officials. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reiterated his long-standing position that the Gaza offensive will not stop until Hamas is destroyed. He's repeatedly stressed the three pillars of Israel's campaign are to destroy Hamas, remove it from power in Gaza and release the hostages. Netanyahu acknowledged the very heavy toll that the war was taking on the IDF soldiers, 153 of whom have been killed since the start of the ground offensive in Gaza. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and we're joined here tonight in the studio to shed more light on this file by Ambassador Mithat al-Maligi, the former Assistant Foreign Minister. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. Your Excellency, now Egypt has uh, a proposal uh, to, to effectively end the war and the situation uh, within the Gaza Strip. It's divided into three phases. The first phase uh, talks about uh, handing over the exchanges of host hostages, civilian hostages, the women, children, uh, the elderly and the, the sick. The second phase is uh, proposing forming a coalition government between uh, Farah and Hamas, the Palestinian Authority, and Hamas as well. The third phase would uh, include the exchanges of the military personnel. Mm. Uh, how feasible is such, and effectively, obviously, ending uh, the whole war, but how feasible is such a proposal? How do you see both sides accepting the terms of this proposal? Well, first of all, I have to uh, be clear on the point that Egypt have prepared, prepared and have offered many proposals. Mm -hmm. This is not the first one, and I believe it won't be the last one. Uh, when the situation got tough, everybody search for Egypt to find a solution and I hope this one will be accepted by both parties as you have seen and we've all witnessed that many leaders of Hamas mm -hmm. were in Egypt they spent several days yes. here in order to formulate this the signs that we've seen from Hamas are quite positive of course they, they have to put their own uh, thinking on the if we can call it a road map for a permanent ceasefire. But the most important thing is the Israeli position. Is Israel satisfied from the result it achieved so far? Uh, let's look into uh, some facts. There is no doubt that uh, Hamas infrastructure has been, has been uh, touched mm -hmm. severely uh, to, to a certain extent. Of course, this is not the end of Hamas. And as many observers have mentioned that the Israel illusion or dream of totally erasing Hamas is out of the question. It mm. cannot happen. And if it happens, it won't be at the cost of thousands of Palestinian civilians, a cost that neither the, uh, the, the, the Palestinian nor the Arab community and even the American or the European can accept as a price to erase Hamas. So the, 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 the illusion or let's say the ambition mm -hmm. of Israel of wiping totally Hamas from the scene is not there. But I mean, that's a general point of view, but the, the man in charge, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, he did admit it comes at a high cost, obviously, this war. But when he met with the families of the Israeli hostages, he made it very clear that they will not get these all the hostages unless they totally and entirely wipe out Hamas off the map. Well, this is this is nonsense. Actually, it cannot happen this way because, as as we just mentioned, mm -hmm. the plan of Egypt consists of getting back all the hostages from the Israeli uh, from the Palestinian. Uh, authorities in Gaza. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, the, the hostages are going to be delivered to Israel, as well as uh, 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 a substantial number of uh, Palestinian prisoners or hostages in the Israeli dungeons. Mm -hmm. So we have to see, to see it both ways. Yes. Let's, uh, let's put it this way. I mean, there is a lot of pressure here from everywhere. Every country has a certain uh, price that it has to pay in order for this 
to go on. Uh, I, I consider that the main player now is going to be the United States of America. Mm -hmm. uh, Israel, if it, would up, if it would have been up to it, I mean up to the current government, wouldn't stop until annihilating totally the Palestinians, the 2.3 million mm -hmm. in Gaza. This is maybe the, the thinking of Israel, that all kind of resistance is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem. It's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a occupation, and accordingly there is uh, liberation movements mm -hmm. that needs to, uh, to 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 work to liberate the the, the country. Yes. Uh, but the United States are, are the main player, and the United States are facing with many problems now. First, we are approaching the elections, and mm -hmm. President Biden need to end this chapter in order to liberate himself to be able to go into this uh, election with some kind of victory yes. that he convinced Israel of stopping the war and the genocide that is happening there. And uh, we, we see that there is a divergence between the point of view of the United States and Israel. And it's getting wider by the day. The, the, the cost that Israel is ready to pay is a cost that the United States and the international community is not willing to pay in order to wipe out Hamas, as we said. Mm -hmm. The narrative is changing. Everybody understands now that it's not a war between Israel and Hamas. It is a war between Israel and the Palestinians. It's, not, it's no longer Hamas only, because the victims, as we have seen, are by the thousands, and all of them, or if not most of them, are women and children. Yes. So those are not Hamas operators. Mm -hmm. They are just pure civilians who are paying the, the price and paying the cost from both sides. I yes. mean, we have to admit that this war, when it was launched, uh, I mean, the final episode, when it was launched the 7th of October by Hamas, had to drag this price onto the Palestinians. So the price is going to be everywhere. But one of the, the most important thing in the Egyptian plan, as you mentioned it, which is something that we've been longing for uh, such a long time, which is finally a glimpse about a Palestinian unity. Mm -hmm. This is a very important, and I believe it would help to have one united front vis-a-vis -vis Israel in order to maybe finally negotiate the two-state solution. Yes. And the two-state solution now is not accepted from the Israeli side. Mm -hmm. And this is another problem. I mean, it will take a while before we can move to the final step, which is peace talks and peace negotiations yes. in order to establish a Palestinian state next to the Israeli state. Well, talking about the coalition government, over so many years there was, uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, ending the divisions between the Palestinian factions. And yes, they, you know, I mean, they, they are united at some point and then they're divided again. But at this point in time, I mean, we've seen uh, head of the uh, political bureau of Hamas, uh, Smaid Haneya, meeting and talking about collaborating with Hamas and forming uh, some sort of a technocrat government. Are they now in a position, a weaker Hamas, are they in a weaker position that they would actually welcome such a coalition? The Palestinian Authority probably would obviously welcome uh, having some sort of an authority over the, the whole situation. But what about Hamas? Would they be uh, easily willing to form such a coalition? And how would the Israeli side react to such a coalition? I mean, the recognition of Hamas still being in some sort of control within a coalition government? Well, first of all, Hamas did this uh, operation of the 7th of October without consulting any of its traditional allies. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen even uh, the Iranians saying in a, in, a, in, a, in a clear and blunt way that you didn't consult with us, so don't talk to us about now about helping you out. And so we heard the same thing in different words from Hezbollah in Lebanon. So the traditional allies of Hamas are not really in the picture from the beginning. And this politically weakens Hamas a little bit. But this is not the most important thing. I think Hamas have seen during all the 70 plus days of uh, war, uh, almost three months now, mm -hmm. uh, we have seen that the PLO and the Palestinian Authority and Fatah 
everybody in a certain way is, I, I don't want to reach the point that they are actually supporting Hamas as much as they are not condemning Hamas. Mm -hmm. We've seen this in several TV interviews, whether we are talking about in, in, in many of the Palestinian representatives in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the Western mm -hmm. Hemisphere, mm -hmm. or even in, uh, in Ramallah. We didn't hear words of condemnation, which is a kind of political support of what Hamas did. Mm -hmm. But this, I think both of them now see that without this unity, everybody is going to pay a very high price. This is the only hope they both have is to have someone else but Hamas to govern Gaza. I don't think that the international community, especially the Western community, is going to accept Hamas again in power solely mm -hmm. in Gaza after the end of this war. Mm -hmm. So they have to be this technocrat government that will reign over not just Gaza, Gaza and the West Bank in order to have a united face mm -hmm. in front of the Israelis. This is the common enemy to both of them. Yes. And they have to be united in order to fight this enemy, even fight it diplomatically. Mm -hmm. The idea of having two separated forces is weakening both of them on one side and allowing Israel and permitting it to say that we don't have in front of us a negotiator that we can talk to about a final settlement, mm -hmm. although that, of course, the recent, uh, the recent uh, uh, press releases from the government and especially from Netanyahu and his far-right coalition, that there is no more two-state mm -hmm. solution. But of course, this is now, but I think at a certain point with international pressure, especially American pressure, because the Americans from the beginning said that they are, they are in favor of a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. And this has to happen. Or we are going to repeat the whole cycle once again in a few weeks or a few months. Yes. Well, Your Excellency, I mean, you've mentioned that maybe Hamas is not really getting the same backing and same support from the, the usual allies, Hezbollah or uh, Iran. Or, uh, but still, we see Iran playing some sort of a role because I mean, we've seen the, the, the assassination of high-ranking uh, advisors within the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. So. We've seen uh, the attacks taking place as well uh, on the borders with Lebanon. And obviously, all the, the shipping situation that is taking place within the Red Sea that actually called for the U.S. W along with 20 uh, countries to form some sort of a coalition to protect the uh, maritime navigation within the Red Sea. So are they still, I mean, they might not be publicly endorsing Hamas, but they do have a big role that they are playing within the whole situation. Of course they do, and they have their own interest in, mm -hmm. in the region. Uh, don't forget at the beginning that the United States uh, and Western allies moved a lot of naval pieces mm -hmm. into the Mediterranean and they gave a straight warning to Iran not to interfere with what's going on. And this was not just addressed to Hamas. I mean, this, I mean the, 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 the Mediterranean Sea is crowded mm -hmm. with na Western naval forces. Yes. And of course now the coalition of almost 20 countries in order to secure uh, the Red Sea for uh, the shipping, which is something actually it is in our own interest as well, because the Suez Canal is suffering from uh, many boats, tens of boats, who are switching from uh, from from turning around mm -hmm. from Suez Canal to turning around the whole Africa. Yes. And although it's costing more money and more time, but, it's but they are willingly mm -hmm. doing it to secure their boats. Nobody wants to see their ships turned into mm -hmm. a hostage into uh, with the Houthis in Yemen. So the idea is that there is, as I said from the beginning, there is a lot of pressure everywhere. Uh, the, 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 the public opinion, and which I think is a major player that we've seen for the first time in this war, is affecting the position of each and every country. Mm -hmm. To the point that we've seen uh, contradiction, clear contradiction the, from the governments, from the governments in the West in general. They don't know what to do. I mean, on one side, traditionally, whoever supports the Palestinians or Hamas or the liberation movements is doomed to be uh, supporting terrorism. Mm -hmm. 
and they, they sometimes do so. And at the same time, they have thousands in the streets who are uh, against Israel and against what's going on and asking for freedom for the Palestinians. So the governments are really in contradiction. They don't know what to do. Sometimes you see police forces who are supporting mm -hmm. the demonstrators in the street. And sometimes yeah. they are holding them and putting them for 24 hours in jail to, to, for, for uh, obstruction of peace in the city and so on. The idea is that this change of public opinion have really uh, shocked the Western governments. They don't know how to deal with it, but they see that things are changing yeah. and the positions are changing and people are not traditionally mm -hmm. looking at the same uh, scenario that they used to see every time, which I think it's one of the, if we may say that there were a positive result of what mm -hmm. happened is this, that the world is starting to open uh, their eyes to see that there is another reality, but only the narrative of the Israelis and the Western media. Yes. No, there is another narrative which is totally different. And this is a very important mm -hmm. point. Well, assuming uh, a good scenario that actually both sides, the Israelis and the Palestinians, everybody agrees upon the Egyptian proposal, do you think that any sort of activities or operations carried out by the Houthis or, uh, or Hezbollah or Iran could actually jeopardize such a deal and if it could jeopardize such a proposal does that mean that Egypt now needs also to reach out and have its own diplomatic efforts to deal with uh, Iran or the Houthis or uh, Hezbollah to safeguard and secure an Egyptian proposal to be actually carried out? Well Egypt when, when and this is my, my experience as a diplomat whenever yeah. we offer a certain proposal, we have to be in contact with all parties who are included, who can affect this deal mm -hmm. in any way or form. Of course, recently and just before the 7th of October, we've seen some uh, diplomatic contact with the Iranians. And when we talk with the Iranians, of course, it goes through to the Houthis and to Hezbollah and to every other players yes. who is related to Iran. Mm -hmm. And I think that Egypt, if it, if it would want to secure its proposal mm -hmm. and not to have any hurdles or any obstacles uh, in the mechanism of it, will have to be talking with the Iranian at a certain point to assure that there will not be any interference with the plan. The idea is once again the position of Israel. Then mm -hmm. this is what worries me the most. I think that we are capable of convincing Hamas and the uh, uh, Palestinian Authority to accept the Egyptian proposal, maybe with some touches from here or there, but the main idea will remain the same. Mm -hmm. My problem is with the Israelis. Have yes. they had enough? Are they ready to, uh, to, to turn uh, the, and, and switch their positions from uh, these massacres to uh, a civilized nation in order to talk yes. about civility? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is something very important. And here we have, once again, I'm talking about the Western pressure, especially the one of the United States. Mm -hmm. The United States, I think it's about time that the United States stopped just asking Israel to be nice, yes. uh, to be, uh, not to kill so, too many civilians, and to try to deal with it with a certain way of, of, of tough love, if we may say yes. so. Because actually Israel is, I mean, the government in Israel is actually acting even against its own people. Yes. I mean, we all know that the Israelis want to see their hostages finally released. Mm -hmm. And what uh, Israel is doing, the government is doing, they're even killing their own hostages now. We've seen this publicly and we've seen it uh, and, and we heard it from Hamas. Some, uh, some, some strikes that the, the Israelis did killed yes. many of the civilians. Yes. So the idea now is that Israel has to understand that you cannot achieve your goal as you want it perfectly and need. Mm -hmm. You will have to make concession. You cannot wipe out Hamas, but you can weaken it, and that's what you've done so far. Because yes. I believe that among those thousands of, and, and tens of thousands of victims, some of them 
from Hamas. Yes. And some of them may be leaders. We didn't hear about and, and we will we'll not know for now. But mm -hmm. later on, we'll know the number of Hamas uh, operative who has been killed during those uh, strikes. Yes. But the most important thing is that Israel has to understand that enough is enough and it has to stop now in order to release its own hostages yes or it won't have any hostages to yes release. well ladies and gentlemen uh, as his excellency the ambassador uh, was mentioning the u.s actually needs also to apply some sort of pressure the u.s has been uh, part of u.n mediating talks along with uh, qatar and oman as well and Cairo has welcomed a u.n uh, proposed resolution uh, to help support Gaza with uh, sustainable humanitarian aid. Let's check out this report and we'll be right back. Egypt has welcomed the establishment of an international mechanism for delivering much-needed humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip. Egypt considers the adoption of the United Nations Security Council resolution an important and positive step towards alleviating the severe humanitarian suffering affecting Palestinian civilians in the Gaza Strip. Furthermore, Cairo welcomes the appointment of a high-level UN coordinator to facilitate the entry, coordination, monitoring and verification of aid within the Gaza Strip. However, foreign ministry statement said that it is insufficient on its own because the UNSC resolution did not include a demand for an immediate ceasefire to guarantee the provision of aid and stop bloodshed in the Strip. Statement added that the UNSC resolution is in line with the resolution of the recent Arab Islamic Summit, which called for breaking the siege on the Gaza Strip, opening the various corridors for humanitarian access, establishing a mechanism to monitor aid shipments under the auspices of the UN, to overcome obstacles placed by Israel on the aid entry. According to the statement, Egypt fully rejects all attempts to forcibly displace Palestinians and also demands parties adhere to international law by refraining from targeting civilians or humanitarian aid. The statement said the resolution leaves no choice for the international community but to fulfill its obligations to stop the suffering of the Gazans amid the continuous Israeli bombing, siege and displacement. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, continuing our discussion with Hexancy, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Maligi. Sir, now, you've mentioned that the U.S. needs to have some sort of a bigger role than just telling Israel be nice. And do you feel that maybe with such a U.N. resolution, I mean, yes, we are talking about securing humanitarian aid and having some sort of uh, a permanent or at least semi-permanent organized ceasefire. Do you think that with the U.S. elections and public opinion really exerting a lot of pressure internationally in the, the Western community, including the U.S., do you think that is the main drive for the U.S. to try and change or alter its strategy or narrative regarding how it deals with Israel and the whole situation in Gaza? Well, <clears throat> let's look at it this way. We, in Egypt, for instance, when we take a certain decision or when we try to adopt a certain policy, it comes from the national interest of Egypt. In the United States, it's different. We have to understand, and I think most of our viewers know, that in the United States, the situation is different. The, uh, the American administration has to respect the pressures from various lobbies there. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important lobbies is the Jewish lobby in the United States. And any politician, any politician, whether we are talking about uh, a senator, a congressman, a president, any politician on any level, if he does not support Israel publicly, he is doomed not to be elected. Mm -hmm. And based on this, many American politicians uh, fear to speak out against Israel. And I think we've all witnessed recently, we've all seen on, 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 on the medias, uh, many uh, speeches of uh, many American presidents, ex-American presidents, 
such as Barack Obama and uh, President Jimmy Carter. We've heard both of them speaking mm -hmm. about the Palestinian issue in a very, very delicate, a very sensitive way. Yes. And uh, actually, the, the, the narrative wouldn't be different from what we say here in the region, mm -hmm. which means that the, the question is understood. But the idea of implementing it against the will of Israel, this is the serious problem that the Americans are having. And now with the public opinion shifting from the total support of Israel as a victim, as the only victim in the region, this is changing now. And this will create a new reality in front of those politicians and in front of those lobbies. Mm -hmm in the United States, which will, on the long run, change bit by bit the narrative of the American. Yes. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, in a nutshell, because we are out of time, do you feel that the disruptions within the maritime transportation and all the cargo ships, do you think that plays a role within the change of the U.S. stance? Definitely. The United States, as a custodian of the security of all the seaways and mm -hmm. the airways, and all the transportation in the world would definitely not accept an interruption in uh, the Red Sea, and they could interfere personally in the war if this thing persists. And they yes. hope it will not. I mean, the minute we are going to, to reach a ceasefire, I think the whole seas will start to uh, liberate uh, their, their, the ships sure. they have mm -hmm. and maybe will never attack again because this can uh, actually, even it inflicts on us yes, a definitely. lot of problems. Exactly, definitely. the Suez Canal. Yes, uh, well hopefully that would be a hopeful note that would uh, actually materialize into a reality. Still, Egypt is playing a very pivotal role, not just because of its political weight within the whole region, but also the whole situation is part and parcel of our national security. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this edition of the Daily Debate. Before we go, I'd like to thank my distinguished guest, Ambassador Mithat Al-Miligi, the former Assistant Foreign Minister, Your Excellency. Always a pleasure having you with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very me. much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned for more coming up on Nile International. I'm Haini Saif. Thank you for joining us.